Um, okay, so that's it for announcements. Um, we, uh, our first speaker is, uh, we're going to do some lightning talks. Um, we don't normally keep to the five minutes, it doesn't have to, so uh, Eloise? I'll try to. Yeah. Um, there you go. So, name is Alois Baillet. I work for Animal Logic uh, in Sydney. Um, we do uh, mostly movies, animated movies, and uh, etc. And we have a fairly strong R and D um, department of 20, uh, 22, 25 people. So we do development a lot. I've been doing Python for uh, nearly eight, ten years, uh, on and off. So I thought I would share a few tricks I recently uh, discovered, in a way. I'm not sure you can say that. Uh, when using descriptors, so um, just to make sure everyone knows what a descriptor is, the definition from the Python documentation is pretty clear. It doesn't tell you anything about what it does, but that's what it is. Um, are they useful? Basically, pro Python properties are uh, made of descriptors, so it is kind of useful. Um, people would say that that's just syntactic sugar, I think. Um, they're useful. They make Python uh, um, the way it is, uh, like easy to read, etc. So basically, I've found myself writing quite often some code, like look, uh, like on the left where I would create a descriptor class to create an option on a class um, or yeah, properties but with a bit more um, uh, matter to it. And usually I had to copy the name of the um, descriptor and pass it in the descriptor. And I, I thought that was not very good. I didn't want to uh, repeat myself. So don't repeat yourself, uh, try a thing. Um, so I thought there has to be a way. So the way is to use a meta class. And uh, the meta class, basically, um, you change the type behavior of the host of the, um, of the, uh, of the uh, descriptors. And you get a hook, and you can iterates through the class dictionary at that point. And at that point, you have the name and the attribute, so you can inject the name uh, at that point. It's, so it's just a few lines of code. It's not very pretty, but um, it does the trick. Um, another, uh, at the end, I'll just go through a couple of uh, examples so you can see what it's actually looking from the client side. But, uh, as well, you can order them. So if you have more than one descriptors and you want to iterate through all your properties and you're carefully ordered your properties in the, in the code, you can basically retrieve um, the, the property of the code. So basically, just, just by doing in the descriptor itself, um, by just doing something very uh, C Python specific uh, to get the, the line of code. Um, and then in the uh, meta class, you actually uh, get that um, that line number, and then you order, and then you can iterate at the end of the page. So it's pretty simple. Uh, as well, I thought uh, I found myself uh, finding fighting some bugs and just realizing that I was um, setting the wrong name. So when you when you do a set at on a, on a class, and if you just forget a character somewhere, um, you just create a new object. You don't set the property value. So that little uh, snippet here makes sure, it makes sure that um, you only set attributes that already exist, or you can set private attributes if you just put an underscore at the front quickly. And then another use I've made of uh, those um, uh, name descriptors was just a simple uh, string constant uh, collection. So lots of constant that need to be public. Uh, basically, instead of, if they're all strings, of course, instead of using, um, um, of copy, 
copying the character from the left and the right to just uh, create a, a small object that will return the name of the, the descriptor. Okay, so um, the example uh, implementation is just that code basically. Um, so the get uh, at the moment around here uh, will just return the name. Um, so when you do a, a, nat uh, a get on the, on the instance of the post, you get the string. If you do um, a set, you can change the name. But that's really that's the open part. You can you can usually what I do in those places is I retrieve an option value. So I use the object, the object in there, and I, I use that as a container of option values on the instance. So you can do things like uh, self dot uh, is valid, and I would actually do the lookup and returns true. Um, Probably not a good example, but almost finished. Um, basically, that's a few examples uh, of tests. Um, you can look through that later. It's not very important, but that uh, tells you what, how it works exactly. So the main thing is that you create uh, attributes for that, that are just creating a new piece of a class, and then you can start using them. And I'm just one minute over, so that's good. Thank you. Can I just put it on top of this? Or? All right. Um, my name is Ryan Cross. Uh, I'm just going to talk about something that I've come across uh, recently. Um, full disclosure, I'm really not a Python developer at all. I'm mostly PHP. Um, I do a lot of stuff with Drupal. Um, but I thought this was kind of cool, and hopefully you guys will as well. So <clears throat> there's a project that I came across called File Conveyor. Um, it just makes it really easy for kind of manipulating files um, on a web server. Um, so File Conveyor is mainly just a daemon written in Python um, that basically tries to detect, process, and move around files. Uh, the website's fileconveyor.org. Um, a couple of uses for it is to integrate a content delivery network, um, post-process video or image files, publish results for different things. There's a lot of different options. Um, we're primarily using it for integrating with the CDN. So <clears throat> the way it actually is set up is basically with three different um, stages. Um, you discover the different changes on the file system. You then process um, and potentially can chain those processes um, as simple Python scripts and then transport um, the files around once you're done with them. Um, <clears throat> so the discovery phase is pretty simple uh, depending on what operating system you're on. It's pretty much instantaneous. It uses the uh, the yeah, iNotify on Linux, which is what we're using uh, on my Mac, it uses the FS events. Um, it's not really well tested on Windows, or at least I haven't seen it work. I haven't tried it out that much. So, um, anyways, but it supposedly will do do it on Windows through a polling system. Uh, the processing stuff is pretty simple. Um, they're basically simple Python scripts. Um, you can do things like change the file name, you know, run it through a converter, whatever you want. Um, it comes with a couple of built-in ones. Uh, one of the things that we were looking at as well as something like Google, um, Google Closure Compiler to compress your uh, JavaScript. Um, 
we're also mainly using it just to move some stuff around, uh, or sorry, to change some of the names when we're moving them around. Um, we've also looked at possible other ones like image optimizer and stuff, but so far we're not actively using a lot of these, but you can write your own as well if you've got ideas. Um, <clears throat> the transporters are relatively simple, um, just methods based off the Django custom storage systems. Um, I'm not real familiar with those, so some of you guys might know a bit more about them than I do. Um, but there's a couple of them that are already available, so you can already integrate with Amazon S3 and Amazon CloudFront. Um, we're actually just using, we're kind of building our quasi-CDN by just using a separate file server, um, and so we're just using the symlink or copy method um, to just move stuff around. Uh, the requirements, uh, Python more than 2.5, uh, as I said, Linux, um, Mac, or, uh, Mac OS, or Windows, um, you'll be able to just very quickly just do a git clone on it. Um, it's, hosted, it's hosted on GitHub, otherwise you can download a binary. Um, and for us, uh, we've actually got integration with Drupal through the CDN project, and that's the URL for that. Um, so dependencies, most of the processors actually require you to download a binary, um, but that just depends on which one you're actually using. Um, most of them, they actually have like C extensions and stuff because they're doing some of the CPU intensive stuff. Um, most of the transporter stuff, all the dependencies are actually included though, um, which was really made it pretty simple to actually get this thing up and running. Um, I'll try, the, the, one of the cool things about it is that it's all just really, really basic configuration through an XML file. So, uh, I'm gonna have to, I can't see this really well on my screen, so I'll have to look over here. Um, <clears throat> you start off just by defining what the sources are that you're looking at. Um, so you can see there, you're defining uh, the scan path, which is the, the path that you're actually monitoring. Um, and then for us also, it's important to note where the document root is and the base path. Um, we're also, for example, downloading the uh, downloads directory as well. Um, and then we define multiple different servers that we want to use. Um, pretty simple there. Um, from there, then you have your different rules. Um, so in our case, uh, you can define, for example, moving all of the CSS, JavaScript, and image files um, to different locations, which is primarily what we're using it for. <clears throat> Some other examples uh, are doing different things with videos, um, different things with the downloads. Um, does anybody have any questions on this stuff as I'm going through it? Um, as I said, our main case study is actually using it with Taronga Zoo's website. Um, we haven't quite rolled this out, but we're going to be rolling it out in probably the next week or two, um, mainly using it to actually round robin a lot of our assets and push them across different host names so that we can parallelize the downloads. Um, and just pick up the performance boost. Uh, that's actually our current uh, configuration script, so you can see it's, that's the entire thing, so it's really pretty simple. Um, we define the, the one file server that we're using. We've got a couple of different um, transport rules, um, and that's it. So, oops. Any questions? Not sure how I went on time there. Yes? No? Mm -hmm. Pretty much, yeah. You can, and you, you have the different rules set up for different types of files and stuff like that. So you can do different things such as different extensions, um, different file names, and, pre and different folder prefixes and stuff like that, depending on what you want to do with them. Um, we're not doing a whole lot of the processing stuff, but I think there's a lot of power in being able to actually chain the different processes together. So one of the obvious ones for me is if you were uploading a video, um, you might want to upload it in, for example, an AVI format, and then have multiple processes that will convert it to flash video, uh, you know, uh, Windows Media format, uh, you know, whatever else, um, strip out the audio on it and convert it into an MP3 or whatever else, and then have all of those files available. Um, and then you can move them around to wherever you wanted to. So, 
Good question. Uh, I'm pr I mean, we've been testing it, and we haven't had any problems with that, and some of our files are big. Um, but that was one of my concerns as well. I haven't noticed any problems with it, so I didn't really dig into it too much just to figure out how it's doing that. But I assume that iNotify has some calls in it to allow it to determine when a file is either done writing to it or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean we're we're like obviously we've got a lot of different stuff and um, we're doing stuff based off of the different types of files. So we're distinguishing between CSS and JavaScript files. And then we're also doing image files. And then the image files we're distinguishing further based off of where they're actually being uploaded to. So we've got a lot of different, in Drupal terminology, image caches, which is just different versions of the same file, like thumbnails and original files and that kind of stuff. Depending on where those are, um, we're then moving those into different places on the other file server. Both. As far as, I mean, we're doing some pretty basic stuff. Um, we're, I think we're, we were able to actually define all of our stuff just in, in the XML. Um, but I know that you could also um, call a Python script and further define them that way. Any other questions? I definitely recommend, if you're really interested, check out um, fileconveyor.org. It's got a lot more information, pretty well documented. There's actually, the guy who originally did it all wrote an entire, um, uh, I think it was a, either an undergraduate or a PhD thesis on it, so there's tons of stuff about it. Um, I'm sure he's probably got lots of stuff about I know to find there. Um, but yeah, check it out. connections. Mm -hmm. Find the right PGA connection. Oh yeah, I probably have to press the right button on this as well. The red one? Yes. It's the medical display as well. There you go. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. Now I just need both of them. Come on, show up here as well. Oh, good. Oh, no, that's. <sighs> yeah, okay, I'm going to ignore everything else. Cool. Okay. Hi. Um, my name's David Basden. Um, I'm giving a quick talk on how to make a search engine. Um, so basically, um, I found myself quite a while ago. Um, oh, come on. Sorry, I've got a little notebook that's not quite as... That would help. Thank you. Okay. Um, so basically, I found myself a while ago looking for work. And one of the things you do when you're looking for work is spend a lot of time using stupid job search engines. Um, a lot of them, like Seek and stuff, are just horrifying to use when you're trying to look through more than one or two jobs at a time or actually search for something when you're not using a single keyword. Um, I don't know about you guys, but most of the skills I have is not just one tiny little thing. It's actually quite a few, few things, and I'd rather search for them all at once. 
Um, so having a bit of time on my hands, I decided rather than you know just complain about it, I actually just get a feed and write my own job search engine. Um, this kind of worked because I ended up getting a job from it. Um, so I thought I'd go through a couple of the things I found um, and basically give you a bit of an overview of the little the bits and pieces you have to put together if you want to make your own search engine. Um, doesn't have to be for this, doesn't have to be for web pages, but basically if you've got some chunks of data and then you want to be able to search them, um, it's actually not that hard. So um, what are we trying to do? Basically, we're trying to get some sort of documents. Now, whatever your documents may be, if they're web pages, if they're like house listings, whatever, um, and we want to collect them somewhere, and then we want to search on them. Now, the easiest way to do this is to get your search queries and pretend that it's actually a document as well. Um, a document is you know, kind of vague, so let's make it a bit more specific. What are we actually looking at? It's actually, ju let's just say a document is a set of keywords, right? Ignoring everything else, ignoring formatting, whatever, I'm sure we can all go and get a set of keywords out of whatever format we want. So yeah, easy to deal with, quite um, simple to do, chuck them in a set, whatever. Um, what I actually ended up doing because I was only searching for IT jobs is made a huge list of um, IT jobs, IT specific keywords and just used that as a whitelist. It meant that I got rid of a whole lot of problems that you run into like you know, you're having to use stop words like the and 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 are uh, um, messing up all your data. Um, you can't do that for everything but it helped me a lot. Um, yeah, okay, so I mentioned like treating your query as a document. I take that a bit literally. So um, with my job search engine, what I made, did is have it so that you can copy and paste your resume, dump it into a chat, um, text box, and hit search. It'll go through, grab all the keywords, just as it would out of a job ad, and then it has a set of search terms that you didn't have to give it. Um, luckily, that's exactly what it does when it's looking through the job ads. It goes through, searches for specific search terms. So you really got the same sort of things. And it works just as well for a few, few words as it does for a few hundred. Okay, um, so basically we know what we're doing. We're getting the documents, we're getting the keywords out, then we learn about stemming. Now, um, if you're actually trying to um, do some sort of intelligent search, you don't want the exact words. Um, a lot of words mean the same, have the same general concepts. Like fit. here's an example with fish. Um, a lot of the words that their root word means the same thing. So there's a lot of algorithms flying around um, to do what's called stemming, um, which is basically getting the root of a word. And this is really, really useful for getting more relevant matches because that way one term will match a whole lot of other ones that mean basically the same thing, or at least close enough. You're never going to get an exact match, but you so really you can take a lot of shortcuts like this. Um, I'm going to give an example of a really simple stemmer, but it's really worthwhile just going and grabbing one of the public released ones. People have spent years and years of time um, and written doctorates and stuff on how to do word stemming. Okay. Um, and yeah, then basically we have two sets of things, um, both stemmed. We're just chucking them into simple sets. And so all we have to do is compare them. Okay. Um, so when I say compare, what I'm really doing is going, okay, so we have a document that is our search and we have a whole list of other documents. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to assign a score on how each of your, your query document looks compared to each of the ones you're searching against. And then because you have a magic number of how similar they are, you can then do an ordering based on that. You can then disregard some after a certain point, say if there's absolutely no match there at all, and there you have a search engine. It's really simple. Okay, um, I don't know how readable this is. Okay, so um, this is just some sample code I whipped up this afternoon. It's uh, completely unable to use my own laptop. Okay, so this took me about 20 minutes. Um, okay, so. Just simply, we're getting the key. We've got some text, say from a web page or whatever. We're just getting the keywords. It's important to get rid of the punctuation and stuff like that. Um, then all I'm doing is splitting it up based on white space, putting it in lowercase, dumping it out. Um, 
for every word, I was talking about stemming. Here's a really simple stemmer. This one works remarkably well for um, English text if you don't look too hard. Um, it's just removing these things off the end of words. Um, so if we actually take a look at this. Uh, sorry, I'm probably going to run a bit over five minutes. If anyone's getting dead bored, let me know. Um, I find this fascinating, but I'm vaguely aware that other people don't. So obviously I didn't bother coding in very many things, but that's the general idea. Um, same with get keywords. Okay. So, um, oh, yeah, I did that badly. I've got a whole lot of different things here. They're written very badly here, but it gives you a general thing. Every single one of, none of it's optimized for performance. Every single one of these can be drastically improved, but it gives you a starting point to go, here's something to work on. Um, yeah. Oh, come on now. Okay. So, um, We've defined a document as just a set of stems. So here I've just got a simple class to um, define a set of stems and uh, um, what is it? Um, a fact, basically a factory method to generate that from a bunch of text and stem it and then chuck it back as a document. Um, from here I've just got a simple method that um, takes the document that's been called plus another document and gives a score on how much they match. It's really simple. All we're doing is seeing how many of them, how many from the current document are in the other document. And then we're just dividing that by this how many keywords there are, how many stems there are in both of them. Um, there's a couple of problems with this particular algorithm. It works well when all, well, it works okay when all the documents that you're looking against are roughly the same size and have roughly the same amount of keywords. If one document has a thousand keywords and is really relevant and has all the things you asked for, it's going to score way lower than one that has five keywords and only one that you asked for because of the weighting at the bottom. Um, lots and lots of fun to find these magic numbers out the right way. I just jump this in off the top of my head. Um, okay, so then we have a collection of documents, which is just like whatever you're searching against. I got a quick help method to load some files in. Um, and here's the actual search bit, which is basically just going, hey, okay, um, let's get all the files that we have, all the documents that we have here, and um, seeing how they score against everything else, and then just sorting them. Um, then I strip out the score, because I don't really care in this case. Um, you can make lots of pretty graphs. Um, and uh, ignoring anything where the score's greater than zero. No worries, great. Okay, search algorithm. No problem. Um, got some really simple code showing how that all fits together. So this just loads in some documents and searches and stuff just based on standard in. So I'm just going to give that a go and show that I haven't wasted too much time. Um, I just downloaded some pages off the internet. Um, so there was a US election yesterday, so searching for Tea Party um, gives these results in descending order. Um, searching for, oh, I don't know, anyone want to pick a search term from that might vaguely be on this? Picard, that won't be anywhere. For some reason that comes up under dog as well. Um, that I don't know about, but um, it probably means that somewhere in there there's some vague reference to Picard and stuff. Anyhow, um, basically that's it. Um, that's how to make a really simple search engine. Um, you can spend a ludicrous amount of time then tuning that and making it faster and then trying to figure out how to do all sorts of things like um, trying to make it so normally like I actually process thousands and thousands of documents. You don't do it that slowly. You only do it once. Um, there's all sorts of ways of caching it. But um, basically that's the simple way to put a little search engine into whatever you make. So any questions at all? Um, yes, yeah, so in this case, I just used um, links to, um, so in this case, I've got, 
say, Google blog because it had stuff on it. And it's just a file there. I'm not using anything to actually, what? Um, I'm not using anything to download it in real time. I just used links to dump this straight to a text file before. Um, so I just did like dump, something like that, and then dumped it to a file with that name. And all my actual like um, little sim simple test program is just doing is loading in files from that directory, um, the document the document objects, um, well, this thing up there, stores what file name it is just so it can give it back in the results later. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah, I did actually. Um, so, good question, I actually did. Um, it didn't work well for what I was doing. So there's a lot of very, very good generic ways of doing um, pieces of software people have spent a lot of time doing. Um, in this case, I wanted something that was really domain specific. Um, it didn't work well for the inputs I had. Um, and although I could have hacked around with it, I had enough spare time I wanted to mess around with um, this specific domain. So um, I wanted something where I could very easily just say, these are the keywords that I want to do on and then optimize it for that. Um, a lot of the other ones also weren't that fast when I started throwing that much data at it and then tried to get it to mess with it. Um, also, it was fun this way. Yeah, so the short version is you don't have to do this. Um, any other questions? Oh, cool. Thank you. I keep burning the other ones out. Yep, a uh, video is Uh, no, because it's in the main video card. No. Look at the right one.
Okay. <clears throat> announced that they'd done about 100,000 kilometres or something in a driverless car. And I was, very, I was really impressed. Um, I've, for the last year or so, I've been doing a bit of electronics and a little bit of um, uh, robot control on, on something else, which is like um, in cars. And when they came out with their thing, I was just blown away. <coughs> Anyway, I gave it a couple of um, weeks and then I suddenly realised, hmm, I could actually probably do this in Python. Anyway, um, um, there's this guy, Sebastian Thrun, and I just found this on the internet. And he's a Stanford University professor and he said that um, robot-driven cars are going to be road-ready by 20 or 30. So that's another 20, 20 years of work we've got. So I, I, I think, oh yeah, well, why not get started? Now, okay, so why would we even bother thinking about writing one, making one, when, you know, Google are the biggest company in the world and, um, or, you know, close to being, and um, they can do anything that they want much better than me, um, hands down. Right? They've got runs on the board, we haven't. But there's a couple of problems with the Google open source um, car um, project, uh, the Google um, project. It is an open source. So if you want to write Python, you can't just like get in there and do one because they've got like 14 engineers working on their project and they're like brain surgeons. And um, there's just no way for people to get involved. Um, the other thing is that I don't even know if, it, if their one is actually done in Python. It's not done in Python? Okay. Um, well, I, you know, um, that just wouldn't be fun. So the other reason is because um, the computer stuff that I've been doing, what, you put a little computer board, I've got some I can show, they're only about this big. And I just noticed about six months ago that they're actually making new little motherboards that are 10 centimetres by 17 centimetres. And they run the Atom dual core processor, right? Now, that's all well and good, but I also had a notebook that had an i7, which is eight processors. So if they've got the dual core processing motherboard that's that big like now, next year they're going to have the eight processor version, uh, you know, to go in your car. It's only going to be like this big. And I'm thinking, hmm, gee, you know, you could split that up and you could use the Python multi-threading and multi-processing and stick like one bit of the, part of the program to do the camera bits on one processor and another bit of... Um, you know, to drive the, the brakes on one, the other processor and split it up nicely. 
Um, and then three years later, down the track, what are they going to have? They're going to have 16 core processors, you know, running Python in your car. Yeah. It's just, it's just mind-boggling the amount of processing power. Um, yeah, so not having any Python, you know, in the car, not having written anything, uh, I just wouldn't want that. Now, when I had a look at it, I actually came to realise that Python and the Python open source source world actually has everything probably to do as good a job, uh, you know, just a world-class job of this um, project. Okay, so this is the, the, the boring stuff. Um, this is the hardware. Um, up the top, <clears throat> I'm just giving you a rough idea of the hardware configuration. Um, and this is probably all together maybe under three or $400 for all of this. The motherboard here, that's the, that's the Atom um, processor uh, with the dual cores. There's a couple of $30 webcams. Uh, this little thing in the middle, that's an ultrasonic sensor. You could probably add some lasers to that, but they're a bit illegal. Um, to boot the motherboard, um, what you, you only need, and have an operating system, you only need a USB stick, because that can run Ubuntu. Uh, that little um, dotty thing under there, that's the GPS module. Um, up the top, I've got three steering, I've got three um, stepper motors. Uh, you need to run an accelerator to make the car go faster. You need to run the brake to slow you down. And you need to run the steering wheel to turn it like that. Now, I'm very simplistic and stupid, but starting off at a whole level, that's basically what you need. You might need some other things, but, you know. Okay, so we've got the hardware out of the way. Now we want to program. And this is a little bit scant on detail here, as you can probably see. But this is about 20 lines of high-level um, Python um, that you need to um, do the basics. And that is um, start up, um, make sure you've got all your devices. Um, before you start running, get some sort of a destination like as in where you want to go. And then when you're actually like going, you've got to check your directions all the time because this is a, a running loop, right? So you want to be checking your directions that you're going in the right way. And that talks to your GPS and whatever it is. Um, you've got to check for obstacles um, ahead of you. So you've got to check your cameras. Uh, you've got to do something about how fast you're going. You've got to control your steering and then just keep on in that loop until you get to your destination. <clears throat> okay, so here's some um, of the technical um, detail. Um, how does the actual car see? Well, when you actually have a look around on the internet, I'm not saying these are very good, but a lot of these people have put a lot of work into them. Um, there's a Python computer vision framework. There's um, an com open computer vision um, project that um, does um, stuff that uh, does just this kind of thing. And uh, my idea was, <clears throat> and computer vision is written in C++ because it needs to be fast because it's, it's scanning frames of images as they come in. Um, so that would be okay. And then you have um, that process um, sending some um, messages to the... Uh, high-level Python controller with um, something like Dbus or something like that. Some inter... Right, so we've done all that. Um, now, one of the things that... Um, uh, you know, this is a very serious um, issue. Um, and I think this is one of the problems that the car makers actually have. Like, you make yourself a Python robot car, how are you supposed to test it? You know, like, um, you want to test a pedestrian walking across the baby, across the intersection with a pram, right? You know, and it doesn't work. You, like, kill the mother and the child. <laughs> you can't redo that test all the time unless you move to a, 
a different country, and even then, you know. <laughs> if, so, you know, and and um, so testing like pedestrian crossings uh, and things going wrong, and actually, like, can you think about how uh, impractical it is to actually do a lot of track testing of a driving robot? It's 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 almost, I'll just say, ridiculous. So, being a software sort of guy, I thought, ah, oh, okay. No, you wouldn't do that. You'd use test anything protocol, um, which is actually a serious answer, um, because what you what you'd want to do is <clears throat> you would want to set up a um, a list of um, probably tens of you know thousands of test cases. For example, um, you can with a test anything protocol with Python unit testing, you can set up tests. Uh, to test the navigation system, like for example, you can have um, a list of, uh, you know, a list of routes that the thing's got to follow, that the thing's got to navigate, turn left, turn right, blah 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 blah. Um, you can, um, yeah, you can, you can do things like, um, for example, you can have uh, an accident um, in the software. And then see what the robot does after you have the accident. Like, you know, I've been in car accidents where it's not my fault. So, um, for example, uh, you're driving along the freeway and you're you're in freeway traffic, and then somebody rams you in the back. Right? Does the car keep on driving? You know, um, that's that's for example one one particular test. Um, another test might be you're driving along, and the police come and pull you over. So, um, you know, are you detecting blue and uh, red lights flashing? And if so, what are you actually doing about that? And because you've probably got a camera sensor in the back, um, you can do a software test, uh, you know, with uh, a, video, um, uh, a video recording, for example, that actually puts a police car on the camera on the back and plays it, and then the test only passes once the car is recognised that there's a police car and that it's got to pull over. So, hard to do in the real world. You know, you drive around looking for police cars to, you know, it's, it's too hard. So, software is better. Okay, but, you know, don't we need, like, need 3D tests? Because, you know, you're not doing it in 2D. Um, yes, you do. You need lots of 3D tests. So when I had a look around for uh, Python sort of 3D software, I came across Blender. And with Blender, you can actually generate complete 3D scenes um, in Blender. And um, this, uh, this one down here, uh, that's a bit of a city. And, and that in the middle of it there is a city. And you can make any sort of um, test track or scenario or, um, you know, you might, uh, any sort of situation you can actually render in Blender and pass across to their game engine and do Python talking to actually get it to generate the visuals for you. Now, why we want to generate 3D visuals is because um, what we actually want to do is you want to replace the camera with a video feed of what the computer is actually supposed to be seeing. And the computer won't be able to tell the difference on a, you know, a modern graphics engine between reality and a computer game. You know, these days they're so close, like, um, it's just, it's staggering. So why not use a 3D game engine um, and one that you can do stuff in Python to actually generate all the simulations um, to pass to the controller. And just to give you an idea of the quality of the um, graphics, this here is a Blender uh, sort of car. And, you know, when I started out computers, my first computer, it didn't even have graphics. And, you know, I can see that that's 
like superimposed, but you know, only just. And so you can you can make up any any sort of situation. Um, the the limit is really in the programming. So what the job sort of becomes is it becomes making up all these simulations and test cases of everything. Um, you know, like, for example, uh, I don't know if the Google um, test car actually works in the dark. Yeah, maybe it does, but I'm just guessing I don't think it does. Because um, unless they've got the simulator that generates the images and turns down the lights, uh, you know, then... Um, you know, that's a very, very tricky thing to do. But in a games engine, it's actually quite easy to do. Okay, so once you've had fun with all the computer game stuff, how do you actually make it actually talk to any of the hardware? Um, and I, I guess I'll worry about that some point. I'm, I'm sort of doing bits and pieces as I can. But you can use Pi Serial to talk to serial ports, to talk to little computer controllers. Um, you can use um, the Bluetooth in Python to talk to the GPS. And you can control the steering and the navigation and the braking uh, with sort of industrial um, controllers. And, oh yeah, and like, why are you even doing this? Um, there's actually many benefits of having a robot um, computer, um, robot control car. Um, the biggest one is safety. Um, if you want to go out drinking, um, you can go for a snooze and you can say, drive me home. And then it'll drive you home. And then if the police pull the car over, uh, well, you weren't driving. <laughs> you know. Um, uh, there's a whole lot of um, safety um, aspects. Um, the Google people report that the computers can react faster than humans. Um, on the Google car, they've got... <clears throat> their design is really good. Um, they've got this thing up the top. Um, so they've got cameras that are actually looking down on the road. And they say that, um, they say that it's actually faster to react um, than what a human is, because it can see things, and it's not texting, and it's, <laughs> it's, you know, like, really when you think about it, you know, like, in the old days, they just had cars, and you drove them, and you concentrated on the road, and, that, and you might have listened to the radio, and that was it. But now, um, you've got to concentrate on texting, and blah, 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 and it's really better, oh, speed cameras, um, uh, a robot car isn't going to speed, uh, you're not going to be worried about, um, you don't want a fast car anymore, you just want one that doesn't get you tickets, that just goes through the school zones at 40, doesn't hit anything, and that you can sit in the back and do your Python programming. So, um, um, basically, um, the one of the advantages of doing this compared to the uh, proprietary uh, car companies is that um, I'm very certain that we can get more programmers actually working on this than what the car companies can actually afford. Because Google only has 15, 15 people working on their automated car project. And if you think about how many um, open source pro um, Python programmers um, there are looking for something to do, it's a lot more. So... Um, um, yeah, there's, you know, the Americans say that um, there's about 20, uh, 20 years to go. Um, but I think in this particular case, it's, it's something that um, open source can fast track. And uh, I'd have, the way I'm looking at it, um, you know, um, a few years is like the outer sort of um, limit because of um, different things. So, yeah, um, questions?
come from White Ryan or from Bassey, I just, I just want to get in your thoughts on that. Like, to be on quite sceptical of anyone saying that the technology is there, something that's been in that infrastructure for now, to possibly have a similar effect. Um, yeah, there's, look, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with public transport um, when you can when you can get it. Um, the uh, in Japan they have um, driverless public transport. Um, the the real um, I can't say that this is better or you know I'm not I'm not even trying to say that this is better or that this is the way to go. Um, I'm just interested in like solving the problems, um, but I think there's enough. Um, I think the 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 reasons why this is going to be compulsory to have as an option is because of safety, right? S safety. Um, the cars um, they're making the cars these days so much faster than what they used to be, right? When I started driving, um, you know, like. You were you were struggling to go to 100, and then you know a little bit you know 120. Um, yeah, you could go faster than that, but you know it took a long time. Now on a modern car, you just press it and you're 120. And if you're driving around Sydney, you know one of the worst things about driving around Sydney is they're putting robot um, cameras on all the on all the traffic lights, right? Um, to stop you from speeding and just to take advantage of human error. Like, um, it's, it's human error in a car, you know, like in a Commodore or a Ford, um, to do 75 because you've actually got to, like, concentrate on that speed all the time because there's no sensation of speed, right? So it's getting harder and harder to drive now. And this just says, no, I don't want to drive. Uh, driving is not interesting. Um, I just want to get there. So um, um, safety is the... Is the um, is the sort of sales um, thing for why you need this? And I think another answer to that question is convenience. Like if you go to cities like uh, New York, you have lots and lots of taxis and lots of other types of cars. Also, they in every city because it was essentially exactly where you want to go. And you don't have to wait around for public transport. So it's amazing to have really really cheap taxis that you can get to most of the places and the price goes up. Price would go up. Everything the price goes up. <laughs> But, Shut down. Okay. I've got one more question. Yeah. I'll just um, quickly point out these motherboards down here, they're only $120 now. And like next year, maybe they're 50 bucks. So it's a lot less investment than a public transport infrastructure system, which is zillions of dollars. And I won't even go there. Um, yeah, hopefully. Sorry, what was your question? Yeah.
Yep. No, because you can test it. Um, I don't, um, okay. Um, I think th the benefit of having an open source system, right, is that you can, you can put up all the tests that the thing should be doing. And then you can have anybody run those tests. And if somebody's saying that, you know, you're missing a test or, you know, your test is failing or blah, 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 um, they can get in and they can fix it. Um, the commercial way of doing it is that the car companies make something and then a thousand people die. And then they, you know, they get sued. It's better. It's proven to be better. Funnily enough. Actually, that's a good point, and I'll, I, I agree with you there. Um, I was just at a roundabout, and I'll give the answer. I was just at a roundabout the other day, <clears throat> just watching cars go around the roundabout. And I was just, um, you know, uh, commenting uh, to somebody who was with me. I was just saying, look, there's a sports car, and it goes, it drives around the roundabout like I do, right? <laughs> you, you're not going to, um, that's not how the robot car is going to work. The robot car is just going to go round very smoothly, slowly around, and then the person, the manual driver, he's going to go around and overtake the robot car. The robot car isn't going to be the fast one going around. It's just going to drive very, very boringly because the person is in the back doing something else. Yeah, for the pub. <laughs> um, thanks, everyone. Um,